I, I want to read you this quote from Timothy Keller, and, and this is, I think it's so true. At least it's been true for me as I've walked alongside people over the last 11 years uh, as a pastor here. He says, no matter what precautions you take, no matter how well you've put together a good life, no matter how hard you've worked to be healthy or wealthy or comfortable with friends and family, successful with career, it will always be inevitable that something will try to ruin it. That's so true, isn't it? And it seems like if you look around our culture today, I don't know if there's more suffering in the world or if it's just that suffering is so amplified because it has a 24 hours a day, seven day a week platform, right? It's called Facebook. Um, but, but listen, like this is, this is where suffering happens, right? Like it, it, it's in our culture, uh, if I wanted to watch something and I know what was going on around the world when I was a kid growing up, I had to turn on the evening news. There was one time of day that I could find out what was going on all over the planet. And really, it was maybe a five-minute segment of news stories about what was going on all around the world, right? Most of it was focused on our national things. Well, now it's a 24-7 hour a day. Like, all the time, we see all the different influences of what's going on around us. You see every natural disaster, not just the ones that are in your neck of the woods. You see every earthquake. You see every famine. You see everything that happens. And I think we're more aware of the state of suffering on our planet than we ever have been before. And for some people, that's led to a place of fear. For other people, it's led them to say, Where, where's God in the midst of all this? Like, what's going on with God in the middle of all this suffering? Where's he at? What, what, what's happening here? And sometimes we could echo the words of Ecclesiastes where it says, you know, it, it seems like sometimes the righteous get what the wicked should get, and then the wicked get what the righteous should get. And there's times where we just can't circle that window and say, okay, I, don't, I, I can't put my mind around what all of this suffering is about and why do we have to go through it? And listen, I think if we're honest, there's a couple of myths in Christianity today. Some people have tried to run away from suffering, and so you'll hear things from some TV preachers about, well, you know, it's never God's plan for you to suffer. It's only God's plan for health, wealth, and happiness, right? And it's like, well, that didn't work out so well for Jesus. Um, and as far as I know, he was pretty tight with the Father because he and the Father were one, right? That didn't work out so well with the early apostles because all of them died for their faith. And so uh, Jesus, in fact, himself said, listen, if you're in this life and you love me, they're going to hate you. You're going to be persecuted because they persecuted me. In this life, you're going to have trouble, but take heart because I've overcome this life and I've overcome this world, right? And so, so there's that, or, or there's this other branch of Christianity that says, well, because Jesus suffered, you don't ever have to. Like if you just pray enough, if you just believe enough, if you just have enough faith, then you can tap into what Jesus has suffered on your behalf. And then automatically you just like your get out of suffering free pass. And I want to tell you, that's not at all what the Bible teaches us. But I think this is one of the toughest questions that we ask. It, it, and this is one of the toughest questions, especially for people who don't know God. And I think it's impossible. Let, let me just say that. I think it's impossible to answer this question for people in a satisfactory way that will answer all their questions if they don't believe in the Lord Jesus. And if they don't believe that something is going to happen after they die. If this world is all there is, then I think it's a really hard question to say, well, what's up with all this suffering? But, but if there's something after this, then I think that we can start to answer it. Psalm, the Psalm chapter 73 says, but, but when I thought of how I could understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I came to the sanctuary of God and I discerned the end of all things. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me uh, with your counsel and afterward you will receive me into glory. Uh, listen, it, it, when heaven is at the end of the suffering here, then we can start to make some sense of, well, where's God in the midst of all this stuff? So listen, some people make this assumption that suffering is the worst thing that could happen to you. It, it, do you know people like this? It's like, I have a hangnail. Is Jesus mad at me? It's like, no, he's not mad at you. Like, listen, some of us, we, we need a little time of suffering so that we actually grow. One of the things that scares me most as a pastor is this next generation of kids 
that are growing up. And I, and I see what's happening. Like kids are so coddled around. Like they're, they're wrapped in bubble wrap. And it's like nobody can sneeze on you or touch you. Or like you have to get a trophy for everything you do even though you're terrible at it. Like it's like you shouldn't make the team. Like you shouldn't because you're terrible. Like you, should, you shouldn't even be allowed to sit on the bench. You should be cut and somebody put a band-aid on your locker because you got cut. Like this is... But, but they're never, never taught how to deal with disappointment. They're never taught how to deal with failure. And we want to micromanage and we make this safe environment so that our kids won't have to experience pain. And you know what? The first time in their life that they actually suffer, they are going to have no clue how to deal with it. Suffering is such a powerful teacher. I love this quote. It says, Christian suffering is meaningful. There's a purpose to it. And if we face it the right way, it can drive us like a nail deep into the love of God and have more stability and more spiritual power than we can ever imagine. That's the goal of suffering, to drive us down deeper into Jesus. And so today I'm going to do the best job that I can to answer this question for us. Where is God in the midst of suffering. Where is God in the midst of suffering? So if you got your notes, just open this up. And, and, and we're going to uh, go through a couple of passages of Scripture. We're going to hang out mainly in John chapter 11. But here's, here's what I want you to know about where is God in the midst of suffering. It's very simple. You ready? Here we go. This is, this is like profound biblical teaching here. Actually, it's really simple. Here, here's where God is in the middle of suffering. God's at the beginning. And he's in the middle. And he's waiting at the end. Where's God in the midst of suffering? God, where are you when all of this tragedy came down on my head? Well, he was at the beginning, and he's going to be with you in the middle, and he's going to be waiting at the end of it. God, where were you when all of this stuff happened in my marriage? He was at the beginning, and he's going to walk with you through the middle, and he's going to be waiting at the end. God, where are you when my loved one is diagnosed with cancer? Where are you when the healing doesn't come? Where are you, God, when the finances, we can't rub two nickels together? God, where are you in the midst of that? Well, he's at the beginning, and he's going to walk with you through the middle, and he's going to be waiting for you at the end. I, I want to read you this verse. You can just look on the screen. You don't have to flip there. But, but Isaiah chapter 45 talks about God in a way that we don't normally think about him. Read this with me on the screen. You can just follow along. It says, I'm the Lord. There's no other. Besides me, there's no God. I equip you, though you don't know me. That people may know from the rising of the sun from the west that there is none besides me. I'm the Lord. There is no other. Now, now read this verse with me, verse 7. This is a way that we don't necessarily think of God all the time. Here, here's what it says. Read this along. I form light and I create darkness. I make well-being and create... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. What? I, I'm the Lord. I make well-being... And I create what? Calamity. Whoa. I'm the Lord who does all these things. Listen, as a believer, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's nothing that can happen in your life that doesn't have to pass through God first. Do, do you know that? Like, no, God doesn't create evil. God doesn't create evil. He doesn't create sin. But there's certain things that we suffer in this life even from the hands of other people, that it has to pass through the permission of God first. Listen, there's nothing that happens in your life that God doesn't plan as a gift so that you get stronger or that he doesn't permit because he knows he's going to be with you through it and you'll make it through to the other side. There's nothing that happens in your life. Let me repeat this again. There's nothing that happens in your life that God doesn't plan or he doesn't permit because he knows you're going to be able to make it through. You remember the story of Job? The Lord is in heaven, and the enemy, the accuser, Satan, comes before him, and he says, uh, who's the one who says something first? God does. Have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like this guy. Well, yeah, but that's because you put all this blessing on him. Listen, you take that away, he's still going to worship me. His life is not bound up in his stuff. His life is not bound up in his relationship. His life is bound up in me. He's still going to praise me. Well, let me take it all away. Okay? Because I know he's going to make it through. I'm going to sustain him through it, and he's going to make it through to the end. 
Listen, there's nothing that can happen in your life that the Lord doesn't plan as a gift. Sometimes as a parent, you have to let your kids walk through struggles. You have to say, oh, you know what? You forgot your homework. I guess you're getting a zero because I'm not driving up to the school to bring it to you. Like, oh, you forgot your coat. I guess you're going to be cold out there on the playground because you know what? You need to learn this lesson of being responsible with your stuff, right? There's times where the Lord has to let us walk through seasons of challenge and suffering so that he teaches us and we grow out of that. And and it's to make us more like Jesus. And there's times where he allows things and he permits things to come into our lives from the enemy so that we say, hey, you know what, God, this stuff is not important. You're what's important. This stuff is not life. You're life. This doesn't really matter. I'm just going to praise you through all of it. And at the other side, we come out more like Jesus. God's at the beginning. Nothing comes into your life that he doesn't plant or allow because he knows he's going to be with you in the middle and he's going to be waiting at the end. Listen, we're going to camp out here on John chapter 11. Flip there with me right now. God God is at the beginning, he's in the middle, and he's waiting at the end. Look look at this story. This is one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible. One of my favorite stories in all the Bible. I think it's one of the most powerful stories there is. It's from John chapter 11. It's the story of Lazarus. Look look at this. Here's what it says. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord Jesus with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. You remember that story? What an awesome story that is. Whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him saying, read this with me. What does it say? Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness doesn't lead to death. It's for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified through it. Here's this guy. Jesus loves him. Lazarus was one of his best friends and their whole family, Mary and Martha, every time they go through town, they always stay there at this house in Bethany. It was just a few miles outside Jerusalem. And so Lazarus is on his deathbed. And what do we do? We run to Jesus. What what do you do in the midst of suffering? You run to Jesus, right? And, And so they send for Jesus and they don't even ask anything. Do you notice this? They don't ask a single thing. They just want to inform him, hey, Jesus, the one that you love is on his deathbed. Like they assume that because Jesus loves him, automatically Jesus is going to come. Like they don't ask, can you come? Can you speak a word of healing right where you are? They just assume that Jesus' love is going to propel him to do something. And so Jesus gets this message that the one that he loves is ill on his deathbed. And he says, listen, this is going to be for the glory of God. Did you know suffering can turn out for the glory of God? I've seen it happen so much in my own life. When I walk through a time where it's terrible, when I miss family vacations because I tear stuff and have to have surgery, or my kid breaks her arm and we miss the cruise. Like, I can't tell you how many people that I get to share with when I'm in a hospital about the grace of God. And they're able to say, wow, you're still smiling through this. I'm like, yeah, because he's good. Like, this is no big deal. And it's an amazing thing. God's glory comes out of the midst of that. Like, when you're so dependent on him or other people or you're forced to sit still because you can't move and the only thing you can do is pray. Like, that's some of the time where you grow the most and jesus says this is going to be for his glory look what it says verse five now jesus what what does it say jesus loved martha and her sister lazarus they say hey jesus the one you love like a brother he's ill and so they assume he's going to come and it says jesus loved martha and her sister and lazarus this is a different kind of love this is perfect unconditional agape type love he said he loves them even more than what they thought Like, Jesus, we know you love this guy. He's a friend, so we assume you're going to come. He said, no, I love him like God loves us. I love him unconditionally. Look at what it says. Now, read this verse with me. This is one of the craziest verses in all of the Bible. Look look at what it says, verse 6. So, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he what? He ran to Lazarus and said, come on, boy, get up out of that sick bed. Well, if he really loved them, isn't that what he would do? This is how we feel sometimes. Like, Lord, if you really love us unconditionally, the very best thing that could happen is for you to bring resolve or rescue to this situation. The very best thing you could do is make my joints not feel terrible. The very best thing you could do is make money in my bank account. The very best thing that you could do is to fix my marriage, God. The very best thing that you could do, if you really love me, is to heal me or to heal that one that I love. Like he says he loves him, and because he loves him, what did he do? He stayed two more days right where he was. 
That's unbelievable. He says, the most loving thing that I can do in this moment is to allow you to walk through this suffering because I know what's going to come out of it. See, we're so one-sided. We have one perspective. It's now, right? But he sees the beginning. He's like, oh, they got this. He sees the middle. I'm going to be with them in the midst of this. He sees waiting at the other side of it. He's like, do you see what I had prepared? Like, you totally didn't see it when you were walking through it. But now you're on the other side of it. And do you see how much stronger you are? And he looks at them and he's like, I love you. And so because I love you, I'm not coming running. Because I love you, my love compels me to wait and let you walk through this season just a little bit longer. And then he says, let's go again to Judea. So all the disciples say, okay, I guess we're going to go and die with this guy. Because there were death threats for Jesus. Fast forward to verse 14. Here's what it says. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. So that you may what? Believe. Believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go so that we can die also. Right? You got to love Thomas. Right? He's like, wah, wah. It's like every time he talks, you just want like this, wah, 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 like this in the background sound effect for this guy. Okay, well, I guess if he's going to go, we'll die too, even though he's going to run if Jesus gets caught. Look at what it says. Verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb. How many days? Four days. Jesus was probably two days journey from where they were. He had waited the two days. So he gets the message probably the day that Lazarus died. And so then he waits two days. And then he travels for two days. And he gets there. Now look at what it says. Bethany was near Jerusalem about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Now when Martha heard that Jesus was coming... She went and she met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. I, I love how this shows how people handle suffering so differently, right? Like Martha's the doer. She's just got to be busy all the time. She was the one fixing the meal. She's like, can't you tell my sister to help me out? Like, I can't believe it. She's just sitting at your feet and all this stuff, right? And he's like, Martha, you, you just stop for a second. You're worried about so many things. She's got to do something. So she hears Jesus is near. I'm not going to sit here and wait. I'm going to him. And so she runs to him, right? Mary is this more emotional, uh, connected one, like this deeply dramatic, worshipful one. So I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going anywhere, right? Like it's so, we all handle grief and suffering differently. Look at what Martha says when she comes. Verse 21. Listen, this is what some of you have thought in the midst of your suffering. And it's the most honest reaction that some people have. Here's what he says. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you just would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Do you know how many of you have said that? God, if you were just here in this moment, my kid wouldn't be walking through this. God, where were you? If you were just here in the middle of this moment, my marriage wouldn't be this hard. Lord, if you were just here in this moment, Lord, this deal would have happened. Where were you, God? You knew we needed this. Lord, if you just would have been here, then this would have been the outcome. Look at what Jesus says. I love, I love she continues. But, but even now, I know whatever you ask from God, he, he can give you. There's still hope in her voice. Look at what Jesus responds. Jesus said to her, your brother's going to rise again. Your brother's going to rise again. And Martha said, well, I, I know that he's going to rise in the resurrection on the last day. I, I know there's coming a day when everybody's going to be raised, Jesus. But th that's not really what I'm talking about in this moment. And Jesus looks at her and he says, Jesus said to her, no, 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 no. Read this with me. What does he say? I am the resurrection and the life. And he says, Martha, you're looking at the resurrection as an event. And I'm telling you, I'm the resurrector. Life is held in my hands. Look, I'm the one at the beginning of the suffering. I, I'm there with you in the middle of the suffering. I, I'm there at the end of the suffering. Listen, life and death, they're in my hands. I, it's right here. I'm the one who brings brand new life. I'm the resurrection and the life. Look at what he says. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, he's still going to live. And, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She says, yes, Lord. You're the Christ. You're the Son of God who's come into the world. She has this faith. Yeah, I believe that's who you are. 
You're you're the one who's going to rescue us from death. You're the one who's going to rescue us from sin. This is more faith in the midst of her suffering than any of the disciples had on the day Jesus went to the cross. This is unbelievable faith in the midst of suffering. Now look at what it says, verse 28. Read this with me. So when she had said this, she went and she called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose and she quickly went. Now Jesus still had what? What what, what does it say? Jesus still had what? Not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met. He's still waiting. He waits right there. Now look at what she says. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise and quickly go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Verse 32. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was, she saw him. This, she's different than Martha. Martha comes very stoic. Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Like, look at what she does. She fell down at his feet. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Like, she doesn't have all the same things that Martha has. She's dealing with this suffering in a different way. She's just emotional, and she's a wreck. God, if you just would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. Now, look at what it says. Read this with me. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, what does it say? He was deeply moved in his spirit, and what? Greatly troubled. This is a terrible translation. This is a terrible translation. I don't know any other way to explain it other than to say that the people who translate it are scared to put what it actually means. Here's what it means. When he says he's deeply moved, it literally means that a riot is going on inside of him. He's angry. He's angry. This is the same word that, that people use for a beast in the wild to, like, to let out the snort out of the nostrils. Like to, oh, sorry about that. In the hazard section on the front row right there. My bad. There's tissues uh, if you need it. But it's literally that he's so angry. He's so angry. Now, who's he angry with? He was at the beginning. He knew this was going to happen. Look right here. Don't miss this. This is so amazing. He, he was at the beginning. He knew that Lazarus was going to die. And what did he say? It's not going to end in death. I'm going to raise him up. It's going to be for the Lord's glory. What, who's he angry? Is he angry with them, with Mary and with Martha? No, he loves them. He accepts their, their grief. He accepts their suffering. Is he angry at the crowd? No, he's not, he's not angry at the crowd. Do you know what he's angry at? He's angry at death. He's angry at sin. Look at what's happened because this is on this planet. Look at how they're suffering. He's right there in the middle of the suffering, right with them. And what's going to happen five minutes from now? He's going to say, Lazarus, what? Come out. He knows what's going to happen. How insane is it that this drives him to a place where he just weeps and he's crying and he's angry. And he's like, this is not right. Sin and death has brought this into the world and this is not right. And I'm angry about it. And that anger propels him to go to the cross to take on sin and death once So that it's dealt with. Now look at what he does. He's right there in the midst of their suffering. And he said, well, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And this verse, what does it say? Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him? Oh, he did love him. He, he missed the deathbed, but he still loved him. He missed the funeral, but he still loved him. Here he is. He still loves him. You can tell how much he, he loves him. Jesus is weeping. He knows the end. Like, do you get this? Like, he knows what's going to happen in just a second. But he takes time to be in the midst with them of their suffering, and he feels it with them. You know that God does the same for you? That right there, the man of sorrows, that he's there in your midst, And he's angry at the effects of sin and death and suffering that comes into your life. And it's this moment where he's there with you just like he was with them. 
Even though he started at the beginning and says, well, yeah, I, I plan this or I permit it. He's right there in the middle. And even though he knows the outcome of how it's going to be so much better that you've had to walk through this terrible trial because you're going to come out the other side looking like Jesus. In the middle of it, he's still there grieving. He's weeping. Look at what he says. He gets to the end of it. Verse 37. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? They're still questioning. Where's God in the middle of all this suffering? Look what it says. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Like this is such powerful imagery for what's getting ready to happen in Jesus' own life. Look, look at what it says. Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha said, well, well uh, Lord, by this time there's going to be an odor. He's been dead for four days. Like, they didn't embalm the body. They, did, they just wrapped the body. What they would do is they would take a large sheet and they would fold it in half. And they would place the body inside the folded sheet and they would put spices all over the body. They didn't embalm like the Egyptians did. They just covered with spices on the outside of the body so that the body wouldn't smell for the funeral. And then they wrapped them up with cloth. And there was a separate part for their head. And so... She says, he's going to smell. Look at what Jesus says. Didn't I tell you that if you believe, you'd see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know you always hear me, but on this account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. Do you know that this happens in glory right now? He's at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and for me about everything that happens. Lord, I know they can walk through this. I'm going to plan this as a loving gift, or I'm even going to permit this evil to happen. I'm not causing it, but I'm going to permit it because I know I'm going to be with them through it, and they're going to come out the other side, and they're going to be better and different and more like you, Jesus. And so, Father, I'm going to let them go through this. And in the middle of it, Lord, help them in the middle of this. They have my Holy Spirit to help them. Send them peace. Send them joy. Send them your love. Send them your encouragement. Send somebody along the way to weep with them and to just cry with them in the midst of their suffering so they don't feel like they have to put on platitudes that everything's fine when it's not and then he's here at the end and look at what he says verse 43 and when he had said these things he cried out with a loud voice say it with me what does he say Lazarus come out now come on now like you know he didn't Lazarus, come out. <laughs> like what did he say like you know this was like he's angry this anger, the anger of God propels him to do this unbelievable, loving thing. So what does he do? Like, say it with me. Like, he probably said it. Come on now. You're like he, he, he was into it. What did he say? Lazarus, come out. Like, as I was reading this, do you realize, like, the image that struck me? Look right here. That there will come a day when Jesus says that for each of you who believe in him. Like two different times. Like there's times when we're suffering in this life and he's just going to say, all right, that's it. They've learned what they need to learn. It's done. Come on out of that time of suffering and come into a season of joy. Come out of that time of depression and enter into the peace of the Lord. Come out of that time of strife in your marriage and come into a season of joy. Come out of that time in parenting where you feel like you're banging your head on a brick wall and come into a season where your kids are indifferent towards you, right? Like that's, a, you know what I'm saying? Like there's a time where he's going to say, come out. But then look right here. There's going to come a day for each and every one of you right before you take your last breath. For every person who knows Jesus, who believes he's the resurrection and the life, where he's going to look at you and say, no more. No more pain, no more hardship, no more trial, no more suffering, no more pain, no more disease, no more troubles. Come out! And in that second, you're going to take your last breath here, and you're going to wake up in glory forever with him. Look at what it says. So the man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips. Like, I gotta, you got to love this. Like, he's like, uh, instead of came out, like, I wish if I was translating, I'd say he waddled out, you know, because he's like, you know what I mean? Like, and he's got like this thing on him. I love it. And so what does Jesus say? Uh, Jesus said, unbind him, let him go, right? Listen, for those of you that are at a place today, you need to hear this. 
where is God in the midst of stuff? He's at the beginning. Nothing happens to you that he doesn't plan as a gift so that you know Jesus, but, or that he doesn't permit and say, I know they're going to make it through this. I'm going to be right there with them, and I'm going to lead them out to the other side. It's going to be okay. Even if they mess up in it, I'm going to redeem it. I'll redeem it, and I'll take their mess, and I'll work it out for my glory. Nothing happens that he doesn't plan or permit. And he's right there in the middle of suffering with you. And he's weeping. He's angry about the effects of sin and death. And he wants you to know his love in the midst of suffering. And he's waiting at the end saying, come out. Come home. Enter into this season of rest. And one day he'll do it forever. I love the way that the Apostle Paul put this when he said to the Romans. He says, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children, then heirs of God and fellow heirs, provided that we suffer with Him in order that we also might be glorified with Him. Listen to this. Listen to this verse. Just close your eyes and listen to this. I consider that the sufferings of this present time. What are you suffering right now? Are you suffering in your marriage? Are you suffering in your body? Are you suffering emotionally? Are you suffering financially? Whatever it is. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time aren't even worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed to us. When Jesus says, come out. He says, everything that you're walking through in this life, the second you take your first breath of heavenly air, it's going to feel like, are you kidding me? I get all of this, and I suffered this. It's not even worth comparing. Where's God in the midst of suffering? He's at the beginning and in the middle, and he's waiting at the end. Let's pray. This morning, maybe there's somebody in this house that you find yourself right in the midst of suffering. And for you, the whole reason you're here is just to say, you know what? Nothing's happening in my life that God hasn't planned as a gift or that he's permitted. Even if it's stuff that other people have done to you, terrible things, the Lord has let his hand of permission come because he knows he's going to be with you through it and he's going to see you through to the other side and he's going to get glory through it and other people are going to wonder how in the world are they making it through this and they're going to see that God is bigger than anything you face he's at the beginning he's also right there in the middle of your suffering whether the healing comes or not he's there in the middle Whether your spouse decides to restore the relationship or in their free will they reject you and walk away, he's right there in the midst of the suffering. He's angry at sin. He's angry at the death that it causes. But he's with you and he will hold you up. He's right there in the midst of your financial difficulties. There's times where he's going to give the word and this special gift is going to come. There's going to be other times where it's still a struggle. But he's right there in the middle with you so that you can know he's more than enough. He's right there in the midst of suffering with your body or whatever it is. He's there. He hasn't left you. He was there at the beginning. He's there in the middle. And listen, one day soon, he's going to say, come out. And at the end of that time, you're going to be able to look back and see how his hand has knit things together and walked you through the most painful seasons of life. And you come out of the fire refined and more like Jesus than you ever were before there's coming a day 
for some of us it may not be that long from now where he calls our name and we get out of this place of suffering and sin and death and we get to be with him forever and anything even the hardest life on this planet for the person who loves Jesus the second they're in glory with him they'll say it's no comparison it doesn't even matter it's not even worth thinking about this lifetime of suffering that I had doesn't even pale in in this little thumbnail compared to what I get with Jesus forever. And so if you're in the middle, just hold on. Because he's going to say, come out. There are others of you that you need to be prepared and just say, God, I don't know what's coming around the bend, but I trust you. I trust you. I just want us to have a time of quiet worship in this moment. I'm going to ask every person to stand and just a second and have their head bowed and their eyes closed. I'm going to ask our elders and wives to come up front. They're here to pray with people. If you find yourself at the beginning of suffering or in the midst, maybe you just want to come and just say, would you just pray for me? There are those of you that have just wrapped up a season of suffering. Would you just maybe come and just say, thank you, God, that you've called my name. You said, come out, and the depression is gone. You said, come out, and our marriage is getting better. You said, come out, and I saw how you've provided. Maybe you just want to worship him this Christmas season. He is your rescuer and your redeemer. Lord, rule and reign in this time. Give us the mind of Christ and set us free. Jesus' name.